She's going to have to do that a lot throughout the day. So that will work on, you know, mobilizing the fascia. I will tell you that it's going to take a lot more than just that to help this diagnosis. Hi, my name is Dr. Courtney Conley, and what we're going to be doing over the next couple minutes is talking about the difference between different heel pain diagnoses, plantar fasciitis, and posterior tibial tendonitis. Both of these can present with heel pain, and both of them are treated and approached very differently. Uh, most of your patients will come in having self-diagnosed them, themselves with plantar fasciitis. It's the most common thing that comes up on Google when they search heel pain. So I think as practitioners, we need to be able to differentiate these differential diagnoses of heel pain. So these are the two that we're going to talk to you about today. So the first being plantar fasciitis. Yes, it is a very common diagnosis. And the reason is, is that as we are walking, keep in mind walking is basically controlling the fall as the foot hits the ground. In order to allow good movement through the foot, the foot has to be very strong. And we know because we walk on man-made surfaces in footwear that basically inhibits our foot musculature that the intrinsic muscles of the foot that support the plantar fascia get inherently weak. And as a result of that, when our foot goes to hit the ground, that plantar fascia can act more like a dish rag and then you can start to get inflammation along the fascia. I think something that else is important to understand is it's the flexor digitorum brevis or the muscle that runs parallel with the plantar fascia is the tissue that you will find the bone spurring in and that's simply because it doesn't have the eccentric control to control the foot. So when we start to get into assessment and treatment, we're going to look at function of the intrinsic muscles and how those muscles support the foot. On the other hand, with posterior tibial tendonitis, these patients will say, I have more pain in my heel or in my foot the longer I'm on it. That is in, that is in contrast to plantar fasciitis, where the longer they are on it, the pain typically gets better. So right out of the gate, you can make a good kind of differential uh, diagnosis there. But with posterior tibial tendonitis, it's the rear foot, when the rear foot goes to hit the ground where they have a lot of tension through that medial aspect of the heel. Something to also remember is that it's the posterior tibial muscle that is the only muscle that is on or active during the entire gait cycle of stance phase. So that tissue has to be very strong in order to control the foot in both eversion or unlocking of the foot when it strikes the ground, as well as when we go into supination to propel ourselves forward. Okay, so what we wanted to do now is give you just a, a quick little assessment on being able to ass assess plantar fasciitis versus posterior tibial tendonitis. Um, keep this in mind. We're only going to show you a brief assessment that we do here down at the foot. In any foot diagnosis, you have to assess the entire kinetic chain. You have to look at how the hips are functioning because those are going to be which, sta which stabilizes the foot. The foot is only going to be as stable as the hip that drives it. So always be assessing up the kinetic chain. How is their proximal stability and how, is their, how are their hips controlling how that foot hits the ground? Dialing down into assessment in the foot, use your palpation skills. Typically patients with plantar fasciitis are going to be tender anywhere along the medial fibers of the plantar fascia. They'll be tender at the heel. The pain can actually also be diffuse across the entire heel. In cases with posterior tibial tendonitis, the location of tenderness is going to be quite different. I like to palpate the navicular here. This is one of the insertion points for posterior tibialis. They will be tender here. They will have more tenderness along the medial border of the foot, up behind the malleolus, and then you can usually trace that tenderness up along the medial tibial border there, which makes sense because those are going to be your patients that can't seem to control their rear foot pronation or eversion. So when we get into palpation, I will basically take the foot into dorsiflexion here, okay? So I'm gonna bring her ankle into dorsiflexion. I'm gonna take my other hand and I'm gonna stabilize that first ray. When I do that, then I'm gonna take my hand here and assess the mobility of this big toe. If I have good mobility of the plantar fascia, then I should be able to be in dorsiflexion, stabilizing the first ray, and get some good movement out of that big toe. 
If I don't have good range of motion here, that could be indicative of plantar fascia that is going to be, <coughs> excuse me, um, restricted if you are causing an inflammatory response at the bottom of the foot. Okay, so we've looked at palpation of the posterior tibialis um, muscle and tendon and also for the plantar fascia. So those should be very good indicators of kind of, you know, where you should be thinking about as far as diagnosis and treatment. Um, for a, you know, to look at the function of the tissue, I love using a single-legged calf raise to look at the sufficiency of posterior tibialis. So we'll have the patient go into a single-legged calf raise here, and then she's gonna come up. Now, when the patient drops their heel down, when they drop their heel down, the Achilles tendon should divide the calcaneus here, okay? What often you will see in patients with posterior tibialis insufficiency is as they go to drop the heel down, you'll see the rear foot evert here, or they keep doing this, keep going there, and because they don't have integrity of posterior tibialis, when she drops the heel down, you can stop here, Jenya, you'll start to see a collapse along that medial column of the rear foot. And as soon as you start to see that collapse, then you know that posterior tibialis tendon is gonna to start to take a beating in the gait cycle because it simply doesn't have the control. Um, another quick assessment that we like to do for plantar fasciitis is to assess the strength of flexor digitorum brevis. Um, Tom Michaud, who uh, has just been a great reference and resource for us, um, has a dynamometer that you can actually use to assess the actual strength of FDB. But for our cases here, um, we're just going to use this kind of card. And what I'll simply have the patient do is I'll put the card underneath the two through five digits of their foot, that would be flexor digitorum brevis. And without clawing the card, I simply ask them, can they contract their toes and prevent me from pulling the card out from under their two through five? You know, it's, it's a good kind of general assessment, but it gives you an idea of how much control they have at their foot. So I'll simply have her try to press down here and I'll try to pull that card out from underneath her foot. I would be aware of cheating here. Patients will try to turn their foot in or lift their heel up. So if you can have them in a seated position at kind of a 90 degree where their hips and knees are at 90 degrees, it kind of takes out some of that cheat. Okay, so you should have a good idea of what's happening here. Is this plantar fasciitis or is this posterior tibial tendonitis? Um, if you have a case of plantar fasciitis, there are multiple, multiple ways to go about treating this. Um, if we're going to go from a functional perspective, then yes, we can work on working the fascia at the bottom of the foot. This is a pretty common thing. You'll see patients rolling the bottoms of the foot. One of the other ones we like to do is to have the patient roll the bottom of the foot and then bring that big toe down and kind of drop it into extension there. And then she's gonna hold, you wanna turn sideways there for a second? And then she can hold this position for a good, you know, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, but she's going to have to do that a lot throughout the day. So that will work on, you know, mobilizing the fascia. I will tell you that it's going to take a lot more than just that to help this diagnosis um, because we have to get the foot strong. So in those cases, what we like to do, I think calf raises are kind of like, you know, everybody on the planet should be doing some type of calf raise. Um, calf raisers are going to strengthen the plantar flexors and they're also going to strengthen the intrinsic muscles of the foot. We know that tissues gain strength through length. So what I'll do is I'll roll up a towel, okay, with like a, you know, maybe about half an inch to an inch. And then Jen's going to place her toes just on the edge of the towel. You know what, let's do this sideways here, Jen, if you could face that way. Okay. So then she's going to place her toes on the end of the towel. Why am I doing that? Well, if I take my foot and I do this to them, I'm lengthening flexor digitorum brevis. Then from this position, she's going to come up onto her toes. She's simply going to do a calf raise, pressing the toes at the top of the range of motion and then coming back down. So that is a good way to work on the fascia as well as to start to improve the function of the intrinsic muscles of the foot to help support the plantar fascia. Post, with posterior tibial tendonitis now, what we like to do is start to control the rotation at the foot, if you will, or how that foot controls um, motion in the transverse plane. So one of the ones we like to do for that is I will take a band and we'll basically do a figure eight around her foot. And she's gonna wanna get some good tension in that band. 
okay? I'm always making sure that this first ray stays in contact with the ground. You want to make sure that the big toe does not come up off the ground when you do this. So we're basically going to have the forefoot planted and we're going to be screwing the rear foot to start to control or activate some of that posterior tibialis. So she's going to anchor here and then you can see her foot going into supination here and she'll be able to tell you, yes, I feel that along the medial aspect of the ankle and going up into the medial tibial border. So again, she'll come out and then slowly come back into midline. What I do not want my patients to do here is that, okay? Because the, now they're going into too much tension through the tendon. So again, they can do multiple um, reps of this making sure that that big toe stays anchored on the ground. Calf raises also for posterior tibialis is a wonderful way to control that motion. We'll have them put a ball at the heels and then also do calf raises there.